gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Source Material Comics Podcast. I am Jesse Starcher, and we are coming back at you. And uh, I invited on here Chris Armstrong, of course, my brother from another 90s mother. Uh, how you doing there, Chris? We ready to talk some Spider-Man tonight? I'm down to talk a little Spider-Man. I love to hear that. So I threw it in your court. I said, I got to do a Spider-Man book, but you choose. If you want to talk about one, let's do it. You chose Spider-Man Blue. This is a Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale joint, and I'll talk a little bit about them here in a few moments. I want to ask you first, like, why did you choose this one? Um, well, there are two kind of two reasons, I guess, really. Uh, one is I haven't read this in about 20 years. I read it when it first came out. I picked up the issues uh, and I remember liking it, but I don't didn't remember much about it. Uh, and also it's a, you know, like you said, it's a Loeb and Tim Sale book. And, uh, you know, Tim Sale passed away recently. Uh, so I thought that'd be this would be a good chance to kind of talk about him a little bit. Yeah. I think the second year of the Source Material Comics podcast, we did a long Halloween. Probably the most famous like work that those two did together. Right. Long podcast. <laughs> I remember. Long we, <laughs> yes, it is. I, and we also covered Dark Victory at some point, which mm-hmm. I think is the sequel to that. I knew about Jeff Loden, Tim Sale back then. I had seen that they had done quite a few books. Long Halloween hits 1996. This pair of creators have also done stuff in Marvel. There's a neat, like, color f- theme through right. the stories that they have. There's Daredevil Yellow. And I started, after I read this, I was so, like, enamored with <laughs> these guys. I was like, I'm going to read Hulk Gray. And I haven't finished it yet. And then there's also Captain America White, which came out in 2008. Did you read any of those ones from the the Marvel colored ones there? I don't recall if I read Daredevil Yellow or not. I probably did, but I don't really remember. I know I picked up Hulk Gray and Spider-Man Blue, and then when they did Captain America White, which was like a long-rumored thing. I I believe Loeb was DC exclusive for a long time, and they didn't do Captain America White until he came back to Marvel, like in the mid-2000s. I want to, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I think that's how it worked out. But yeah, Captain America White was rumored for a long time, and I think they even put out an issue zero, and then it was several years before they got around to actually putting out the, the full mini series. But, uh, I but yeah, it, I, I read pretty much all that stuff. So this, like I said, this pair has come together for our book that we're going to be talking about tonight, which is Spider-Man Blue. So you said you were picking the issues up of this off the shelves, right? This is 2000, July of 2002 to April of 2003 is the publication date. So you're reading it pretty faithfully. Were you like, okay, I've heard of these guys, or was it wizard hype that got you picking this up, or what was going on? Uh, Well, by this time, they had already done Daredevil Yellow and Hulk Gray. And I don't remember about Daredevil, but I know I read the Hulk Gray series as it was coming out. So, yeah, I was familiar with them, and I'd already read Long Halloween by that time. I wasn't 100% sure, but I went through and found my back issues. Uh, I had, yeah, so I've still got those from, from back in the day. Nice. Unless there's anything else, I'll go ahead and do the quick synopsis and then we'll talk our get our talking points and uh, start it here. Okay. Peter Parker has always been haunted by the death of his girlfriend, Gwen Stacy. Now, years after her death, Peter sits in the attic of his home with an audio recorder detailing his early friendships with Gwen, Harry Osborne, Flash Thompson, and the new girl on the block, Mary Jane Watson. Pete also talks of an, uh, of an encounter with some classic Spider-Man rogues, such as the Rhino, the Lizard, and the Vulture. All of them pawns used by a mysterious villain that was hunting Spider-Man at the time. <laughs> by the end of the tale, on Valentine's Day, we get to see the very beginning of Pete and Gwen's romance, a holiday that Peter will always remind him of the love that he lost. There it is, man. I I think that might have been 30 seconds. That might have been the quickest synopsis I've ever done. Number one, this is kind of like, even though it's action packed and we're kind of retelling stories and kind of the in-betweens of stories from previous issues of Spider-Man, which uh, the series recounts events from The Amazing Spider-Man, Volume 1, 40 through 48 and 63. Craven wasn't... repurposed those stories and framed Craven as the mastermind of it. Let me, I'm going to share with you real quick my screen just to kind of show you what I found here. Um, so there is amazing Spider-Man number 63. Uh, see, it's, I was, that's one thing I was really curious about was the, the other vulture. Like, I was like, is this an, is this a real guy or did they just 
make all this up for this miniseries because my right. knowledge of the Lee Ditko and Ramita Jr. or Ramita Sr. era is very limited. I, I know like the big stuff, kind of the big uh, events from those issues, but I haven't right. read a lot of this stuff. Yeah, one of the things that's happening in this story for our listeners here that there is another vulture that appears, Blackie Drago. So Blackie Drago shows up while the, the original vulture is in, while he's in prison and he has a heart attack. Uh, I believe, or he's poisoned or something like that. But either way, I he think is... Blackie uh, poisoned him to cause that heart attack. That's right, because Craven's like wanting him to take the wings of the vulture and go go get Spider-Man. And then when he doesn't do it, he goes and visits the original vulture who's in the hospital and gives him some kind of antidote to help him and says, why don't you go after him? Because the other guy failed. Something along those lines anyway. But either way, there's two freaking vultures. <laughs> um, and we got uh, the, that's uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 63 has a cover of Spider-Man. It looks like Spider-Man's face coming out of the light or, or, you know, I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's like the spider signal or something. And then but you got the two vultures on the front of this uh, front of this comic. Uh, so, again, these are these are tales that are happening in between those issues. Probably a cover gallery that we could look up. Got it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me see this. Oh, that, okay. So yeah, that's where this tale starts with is with the Green Goblin, and it's like this is right when Green Goblin is saved from the burning house and wakes up with amnesia. Mm. So I mean, that's obviously what happens in the story too. It kind of talks about the Green Goblin. I think Spider Man's about to leave him there in the building, or maybe possibly, or I, I don't know what's going to happen. He he thought he was dead at first, but either way, he re- he he pulls him out of there, and Norman takes his. You know, he he doesn't realize. Yeah, he lost his memory. Yeah, uh, he doesn't uh, he doesn't remember who Spider Man is. Who at that time he knew that Spider Man was Peter Parker, uh, but now he's lost his memory. So there's that that bit of melodrama going on too. Like, oh, you know, I'm hanging out with his son, and uh, I, it bothers me that he's in the hospital and he could know or say something. Maybe he'll get his memory back any day. Mm-hmm. Then my first point that I was going to was going to make is that, you know, the, these take place in these action packed issues back in the day, back in, uh, you know, in these 12 cent issues of Spider-Man. But it's a very somber comic because we start out in I'm going to put in quotes present day where Peter is on it's on Valentine's Day and he's remembering the day that he fell in love with Gwen Stacy. You know, I look at it at like he's just he, it's a form of therapy for him to take this recorder and talk because that's what's happening throughout most of this issue is he's talking to Gwen and recording it and kind of talking about the day that he first fell in love with her and how all the events that led up to it. It's a very emotional piece, in my opinion. I mean, it definitely is somebody trying to cope with the loss, and that's their way of dealing with the loss is by talking to the person that passed away. And and he says that he was keeping track of this or he's recording it because somebody may want to know someday. Which is a neat way to frame the story, I think. Uh, Peter going back and, and remembering his 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 interactions with these rogues of uh, this rogues gallery of villains, plus all the events that led up to him finally falling in love with Gwen. I guess that's really my first note is that I I think it's a great way for them to frame this and a very emotional way of doing it as well. To that point, there's a little bit of like almost mis- not really mystery, but like you don't find out until the very end last few pages that he's telling this story from basically current Marvel continuity at this time. So he is married to Mary Jane. Cause as I was reading it, I was wondering he was referencing Mary Jane cause she's part of the story as well. And so I wasn't sure like when, what point in time he's actually recounting all this stuff. Uh, if it was, you know, just after she died or shortly after she died, or if it was, you know, after he had already married MJ and everything, which ends up being the case. They write Spider-Man so well in here. What do you think? Do you, do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Especially, you know, there's a lot of cool touches like um, with Peter. You know, this is classic era Spider-Man. Right. They're college age at this point, but he's still the skinny nerd. And, you know, he's he's at the big party, the housewarming party for him and Harry kind of later in the book. And everybody's just throwing their coats on Peter. And <laughs> he gets kind of buried underneath all of it. Uh, he's kind of an afterthought at the party, um, you know, for the most of the, of the issues, Flash is still treating him like dirt. Jonah is like the classic, you know, J, J, Jonah, J. Jonah Jameson. I didn't realize how much I missed that because, like, you know, he's been all kinds of stuff. He's been the mayor in recent Marvel continuity. Right. He hasn't been like just the old cigar chomping 
hot-headed publisher of the Daily Bugle, it seems like, in forever. So it was cool to see that version of, of Jonah again. You know, we get this snapshot of his relationship with all of his friends. Uh, you mentioned Flash Thompson, who, yeah, of course, he's the classic jerk to Peter that we all knew him to be. But there's a couple pivotal moments in this series for him, too, where Flash loves Spider-Man. Can't right. stand puny, can't stand puny Parker, <laughs> <laughs> but he loves Spider-Man. It cracks me up throughout the whole book how Gwen and Mary Jane are like just falling over themselves kind of for Peter Parker. Yeah. And Flash can't understand one bit of it. He cannot understand, cannot fathom how these girls are after him this whole time. It, it's great to see that. I mean, we get one pretty important moment for Flash here, uh, which is the Amazing 15 homage, I guess is what I'll call right. it. And his character development where he makes he gets inspired by Spidey. I mean, I have never went back and read a lot of the classic Spider-Man stuff. So it's mm. not like, you know, I, I you know, I can say this from a point of experience. I just know that that has been a, a, a thing that's happened in today's Marvel universe is that he was inspired by Spider-Man to go into the military. I do wonder if like the moment where he kind of is won over a little bit on Peter, if that is something Loeb wanted to inject into the Marvel history, because I wonder if maybe at the time there wasn't really that light bulb moment for Flash. If, it, if eventually a writer just got was got to a point where he was like, the Flash bully and Parker stuff's old hat. We're just going to you know, move on to where they're kind of on a more friendly terms. But in this book, we actually kind of see that transpire. Um, yeah. And, and maybe that happened in, you know, one of those old comics. I don't know because I haven't read them. But, but yeah, I did. I did love that splash page that Sale put together. That was basically the cover of, of Amazing Fantasy 15, except he's saving Flash, <laughs> Flash. instead of carrying a, a, a thief or whatever. I also found it kind of interesting that Flash has always been a blonde and he's a redhead in this, it looks like. Maybe it's supposed to be like a strawberry blonde type here. I assume that's just to, to create more of a contrast between Gwen's uh, bright blonde hair rather than having two characters that look like that. It, it's it's intended oh, you to know, stand out more. But You, you might be right. I, I will say that Tim Sale's art, sometimes it can be really simplistic, mm -hmm. but very powerful for some reason. And I don't know how I'm not an artist, but I know there's a way right. to, you, you could figure out a way to convey that he does it. There is a specific panel that I, I pulled. I think it was in the later issues of the series where it's when Mary Jane, maybe it was in the second or third issue, but Mary Jane shows up at like the malt shop or wherever they're at. And all she's meeting all the guys. She's just brand new to this group of people and she's kind of meeting everybody and I think Pete has to leave because of the rhino M may have been the lizard because they were showing on the TV like the lizard had escaped. And yeah, oh, that's right. right. It was the lizard. He's like, oh, yeah, I took that photo. But anyway, there's a panel where I mean, most of the panel is black and you see Harry and Gwen sitting in a booth and they're just kind of talking. I was like, there's a lot of negative space here, but I don't criticize himself for doing that. Right. Like, no. Normally, uh, normally empty space or something like that is be like this. Why isn't this person using this, utilizing the space? In this case, it just felt like it belonged. And I don't know if that's just because Tim Sale's style is that speaks for itself where I, I'm like, well, that's kind of what I expected here. I don't know. Right. But either way, it's not, some of it's really simple. Nonetheless, I mean, if you look at the covers themselves, that kind of gives you an idea. OK, this is going to be a Tim Sale Mm -hmm. deal it's definitely a different look to the art here as opposed to like long halloween which has got a lot more of a watercolor look and i don't necessarily think one's better than the other but it does give sale it seems like the the pencils in this are a lot heavier uh and you know thicker and denser than right what they were in the long halloween you know batman era stuff that he was doing uh, a little more detail I, it seems like there's probably i don't know four or five colors on the page at the very most depending yeah. on what objects are there. But like I'm looking at Flash's face here. He has two colors. One is straight up peach and the other one is where the light's hitting his face and it's a it's more of a yellow and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember that style being the same for just about every Tim Sale thing that I see. So I would assume that Tim has a specific way of saying, okay, hey, just color this one color here and one color here so that it doesn't seem to be overwhelmed by the colors themselves. You know, I don't, 
think he's necessarily great at like action sequences and stuff. Not that he's bad, but that's not what he seems to like excel at. But the the first fight scene in this one with the goblin, I really like. <laughs> I think it really oh, yeah. uh, kind of pops, and a lot of it has to do with the exaggerated features and stuff on the goblin and like the skinny frame and everything. Uh, all of it r- really comes together really well. And he's got kind of a theme. It seems like I think in every issue, page one is a splash page, and pages two and three is like a double page splash. Right. They're all really like, especially that second page, uh, double page splash, are all really cool. But I think my favorite one might actually be from issue, I think it's issue four, I'm trying to, yeah, which is the kitchen of Aunt May. And it just, it's just basically Peter sitting at the kitchen table eating cornflakes. <laughs> right. Aunt May is making tea on the stove, which it was kind of just like a plain generic like scene, but it looks like the first page is an, an exterior of the house, which is also amazing. But, but yeah, my favorite of the two page splashes, I think, is that that shot of just them in the kitchen. Yeah, Tim Sales definitely got a style, and it's I like it. I'm I'm yeah. I'm a fan of it. I, I you know I went back and looked at those um, action shots in that first issue. The face of the green, like you get a page of just the Green Goblin's face. Yeah, that's creepy, but it's <laughs> it, it's great. It's great. And it doesn't look like you can tell it's the Green Goblin, but it doesn't look like any other Green Goblin I've ever seen. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so you mentioned, I think you mentioned some nods and stuff back, in, in, you know, to you know that that era of Spider-Man. The other thing that I thought was kind of neat was how they gave nods to other things in the Marvel universe. I think at one point somebody uh, mentions the Flash, like he's that sounds like an amazing fantasy, and <laughs> yeah. Spider-Man comes out after I think rescuing saving Kirk Connors comes out of the door and he's like, Hey there, true believers. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. There's, yeah. there's some neat little ads to the dialogue in here. Yeah. There's uh, also a reference to Phil Sheldon, who is the main character of Marvel's, the Kirby Usyk, Alex Ross book that came out in the early nineties. Phil Sheldon was a photographer and he's kind of the, the uh, protagonist of that whole series. Well, uh, so yeah, I, whenever Jonah, it needs a photographer for something. He's, he tells Robbie, get Sheldon out there. And okay. Robin, uh, Robbie says, Phil's doing something else or he's out of town or something. He's like, Oh, we'll get Parker then or something. So that was just a cool little like reference to him. There's also a appearance of professor Warren who, of course, would go on to be the clone engineer as the Jackal, I guess, later. Wow. He's he's the, uh, I guess he's like the, uh, one of the uh, professors at the college that they, they have classes with. Okay. The only other thing that I had here, you know, we talked about Mary Jane. She overhears that Peter is talking to this recorder and as if he's talking to Gwen. It, it's kind of a real touching moment because it's not like these two were... And that was a neat dynamic too. Like these two were not like at each other's at each other's throats to try and get Peter Parker. Right. They they were definitely friendly. I think it's mentioned in the book that it took Gwen's death to kind of mature Mary Jane as well a little bit. Regardless, at the end when she walks in and hears Peter talking to Gwen in that tape recorder, he said she tells him to tell her hi for me. And I thought that was a really me personally. I thought it was a really nice touch again to kind of definitely solidify the fact that these people were all friends at that point and Mary Jane and Mary Jane misses Gwen as well not obviously not as much as Peter but she misses Gwen you get to see this dynamic throughout this book of Pete falling in love with Gwen and kind of vice versa and they, you also get to see this foundation that Mary Jane and Pete built their relationship on but also Peter still dealing with the loss of Gwen to this day. It's a romance story with a little bit of superhero fighting involved. <laughs> so right. it, it definitely isn't, you know, Supreme number one. This is a good story that's being told uh, about two people that fell in love. And, you know, I, I, I liked it. I mean, number one, we had a, the, the art I enjoyed and I think it was a, a very touching story. So that's kind of my thoughts on the book. I leave the floor to you, sir. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you there. There is some action, you know, and a little bit of action in every issue, a little superheroic stuff. But yeah, the thrust of the book is all sort of about, you know, Peter's relationship with Gwen and Mary Jane kind of coming into that friend group. It would be understandable 
you know, you talked about the ending with Mary Jane saying, you know, say hi to Gwen for me or whatever. Like it would right. be kind of understandable for a wife to feel almost jealous, like of her husband still kind of right. not really pining for this other girl, but like, you know, because that relationship ended the way it did, it's always going to be kind of an open wound. And like, she's very understanding about that. <laughs> like she's not uh, angry or jealous or anything. She, she, and she understands what her husband's perspective on it is. And that's a great point. I mean, she could have been written to come in there and been like, who are you talking to? Or, you know, <laughs> what do you, what do you, you know? And she's, she definitely isn't. That's, that's kind of what makes Mary Jane special. You know, Gwen is definitely the focus of this book, but Mary Jane's also in there. And you're you're still kind of wondering, like, oh, these two are, uh, you know, back in the past, these two are uh, pining over Pete. We know who's going to win, but how did it happen? And that's kind of what we get the curtain pulled back to kind of show how that how that happened in the in, in the story. But mm -hmm. regardless, yeah, it it all that very last part shows you how special that Mary Jane is because she is understanding as well she's and she loves her husband and she understands he's hurting you know and a thing that people will often say and i don't know if this is revisionist history or this is really how people felt at the time but a lot of people will talk about you know gwen was kind of killed off to make parker's life give him a little tragedy a little more tragedy to the character and everything and kind of i guess set things up for him and mj a lot of people talk about how gwen was like the really boring character like there was nothing to her <laughs> i don't know how true that is because i haven't you know read a lot of the 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 uh, old like 60s and 70s spider-man books but when mj shows up in this in issue at the end of issue two and then in issue three like uh she's immediately more interesting than gwen <laughs> who oh yeah barely like you know gwen mj comes in as you know the life of the party type uh really vivacious and and Gwen is like the girl next door, I guess, and she's kind of quiet. Not not a whole lot of dialogue, really, from Gwen throughout the entire six issues. A lot of looks is what it is. It's <laughs> a lot of looks, but not a lot of dialogue, and that's kind of sometimes all it takes. <laughs> yeah, and obviously, you know, very beautiful character. Right. And they make sure that's clear. <laughs> it, I thought it was also interesting that they never, and I think it's a good decision, like they never show Gwen's death. They refer to it. You know, everybody who's reading this, if you're a Spider-Man fan, in the Anytime after the 80s, you know, you're pretty much going to know who Gwen is. If you've read any, you know, a decent amount of Spider-Man books, it gets referenced enough. So they didn't have to actually show it. They just kind of reference it like this is the period of time when the, the friend group kind of coalesced and he was kind of falling in love with, with Gwen. And we never actually see what happens. We just know that, you know, how it ended up. Right, uh, right. And like you said, this is kind of a bummer. <laughs> it's, it often, uh, it often. Uh, well, and, and and it's, I mean, that's what it's supposed to be because it is called yeah. Spider-Man Blue. <laughs> uh, and I, they kind of make a point to be like, yeah, I do feel blue. Yeah, it is kind of a, a bummer and kind of sad. And it's got, it's good, you know, it's heartfelt moments and it's happy moments as well. But it, overall, it's very, you know, a very somber look back at his first love or whatever. You know, I mentioned we got classic Jonah. We also got classic Aunt May in this. She is as frail as possible. Oh my goodness! Yeah, uh, she looks like she'd definitely be definitely not. Up. You know, the the Aunt May of the MCU or even of the current comics. It's it's the <laughs> the uh, the old maid style Aunt May. <laughs> oh yeah, she's about ready to have a heart attack in like two minutes for sure. Um, if, if she finds out Peter Parker Spider Man, oh my goodness, all the ambulance. Uh, and yeah, and it was nice to see Craven show up because he's. I've always felt he's kind of an underused villain, which, I mean, honestly, he was dead by the time I got into comics. So it kind of makes sense that I don't, you know, have a whole lot of history with that character, although they have, you know, brought him back in recent years. But but it was cool to see see Craven pop in there and pretty good use of the rogues gallery. It's a lot of the animal themed villains. And then Craven comes in at, uh, back clean up at the end. <laughs> Could you I mean, back in the day when you were reading this, did you know that it was Craven that was the guy pulling behind the streets because they don't reveal that until the very end which is a neat way of doing this I'd like to see if that's what happened in Amazing Spider-Man 63 where Craven finds a piece of uh, Spider-Man's costume smells it and mm. it's like oh yeah he gets it he's he nails down the fact that there's a aftershave cologne of some sort and he figures out that it's it leads him to Harry Osborn's apartment right. but of course they, you know, it's right there in the book. He, to <laughs> Peter tosses him the aftershave 
and Harry puts it on and Craven thinks Harry is Spider-Man and abducts Harry instead. I was wondering at the beginning, because the only thing you see, it's a completely black figure. You see his eyes and I think you see the big fluffy whatever. I was early on. I, I was thinking it was going to be the vulture for whatever reason. I For some reason, I associated those big like the big puffy parts of the jacket or whatever with a uh, vulture right. like neck thing. I guess mm -hmm. I was going the same uh, thing. But then when he popped up, you know, in like issue four or whatever, obviously he wasn't the big bad. So, uh, yeah, it was I was kind of it was a surprise to me when whenever Craven did actually show up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I He was on my list. I didn't know for sure. But they you know, this is a story that's been and that might be why they kind of took the revision his, revisionist history role here to keep because nobody knew that that was actually going to be happening. It never did happen in the previous comics, supposedly. Yeah. Right. So now they're That's like, Oh, it's like, I'm fine with it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to argue about it. You know, it's, it's a neat way of still a good story and keeping the villain, the mystery villain, you know, kind of shaded, but yeah, he was, he was on my list. I'm like, Oh, this feels like Craven, but I was like, is Craven going around doing this and, and getting all these villains after him? But, Anyway, we get. Yeah, I mean, we get the giveaway when he used a blow dart to administer the antidote. Right. To that guy. <laughs> Don't want to give him a. You know, if you got an antidote, <laughs> just put it in a needle and actually like. <laughs> he's got an IV right there. I'm sure. Right. Uh, yeah, but all in all, man, yeah, it was a good book. I'm. I'm always. Uh, this was the first time I had ever read it, so you know, I, I knew of Tim Sale, Jeff Loeb, getting these together and and doing these types of books, but. I think I've read some of Yellow. I didn't read all of it. I started Gray. You know, Long, Long Halloween is like one of my favorite Batman stories, which is not, you know, unusual. A lot of people say that. It's up there for a lot of people, and yeah. And I've, I'm, I'm in the middle of reading Dark Victory. I haven't finished it yet. I, I, I've never read it before, but I'm, I'm reading it now. And I've never read When in Rome. But of the Marvel, you know, color books that they've done, I remember liking all the ones that I've read. Uh, none of them are quite on the same level as, you know, Long Halloween. But for the most part, everything I've read that Loeb and Sale have done, I've, I've liked quite a bit. So there is a 1998 Superman series called Superman for All Seasons. Oh, that's right. Now, Loeb and didn't write that, though, did he? It says written by Jeff Loeb with art by Tim Sale. Four oh, okay. issues. Okay. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that one. So it says uh, it was originally published by DC Comics in 98, hot off the heels of their previous success, Batman, the long Halloween. And as, and as that Batman story dealt with holidays as a theme, this story's theme dealt with seasons. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess long Halloween was ho strictly holidays, not seasons. It's been a good conversation. It was a good book to read. Do you have anything left to say about it? Nothing necessarily about the story specifically, but I did enjoy going back and reading my back issues of this rather than initially I was going to read it on Marvel unlimited. Cause I've I got a subscription to that now and it's on yeah. there, but I wanted to actually dig out my issues if I had them, which I did. Did you uh, smell the paper? <laughs> uh, doesn't have. I mean, it's glossy pages. It doesn't have that old newsprint smell. Oh, but, okay. All right. um, I was kind of enjoying seeing a lot of the the of the time ads for like you know what was going on with X Men at the time. Et yeah. And you know most of these issues, if not all, have the little nine eleven twin tower ribbon symbol. Right. Just, Coming out the same, it came out. These actually came out right after Spider Man, the original movie. Um, it was that summer of 2002, so 20 years ago. This is the 20th anniversary of this, which is kind of a uh, wow, yeah, kind of a cool coincidence for us, <laughs> for sure. Um, but the issue, uh, the, the coolest thing I saw in these issues, not not necessarily coolest, but the most interesting thing in the the back of issue one, we have like a four page story: Jay Leno and Spider Man, one night only. What? And this is part two. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and I vaguely remember this uh, being, I think this was in like all the Marvel comics, maybe for these two months. But um, written by Ron Zimmerman, who I know the name, but I couldn't tell you anything he's done. But uh, the pencils are Greg Capullo. Uh, really? So you get to see Greg Capullo doing some Spider-Man, hanging out with Jay Leno for four or five pages. Uh, I did not read it. Uh, and I'm sure it's terrible, but it's there. Uh, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, feel free to look that up. I'm sure you can find it pretty easily online. Wow. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was the most notable of the, of the ads and whatnot that I caught. Nice little treat, man. We did it. You know, like I said, it was a, it was a good book. I think, uh, we had a good discussion here. I would suggest anybody out there enjoys some Spider-Man. You get a nice little glimpse into the history of Spider-Man here. Plus, you know, get a, a new um, 
a bit of a new twist on some of the old continuity. Uh, so I would definitely suggest it. So with that being said, I think that's going to bring our discussion of Spider-Man Blue to a close. Chris Armstrong, thank you very much for coming on the Source Material Comics podcast once again. Are you I'm always happy to be here? Are you ready? I'm ready to hear some plugs, man. You got I know you got some <laughs> stuff you've been doing. Uh, so what, what's uh, what's been a happening? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at BrodyMan34. I've also got another podcast I do with my buddy AJ. Uh, where we, it's called Small Screeners. We talk about um, made-for-TV and direct-to-video flicks on that podcast. So our most recent episode at the time of this recording was a discussion on the DC animated movie Batman Under the Red Hood. And we also talk was about a-, a lot of more recent stuff we've been watching and stuff like that. Um, and then <clears throat> by the time this is up on the air we should have our october episode up which is going to be a double feature episode on uh john carpenter's someone's watching me and toby hooper's salem's lot based on the stephen king book that's a couple of tv movies from the 70s that we're going to be covering and then we've also got a new podcast called because movies that we're going to be starting up in october and Mm. every week in october we're going to have uh, a discussion of a slasher flick, an 80s slasher flick, and it's a uh, modern remake. I should say 70s and 80s. So Texas Chainsaw Massacre and its remake from the early 2000s, et cetera, et cetera. And there's going to be one of those every week in October. Those will probably also be on the small screeners feed. So you can check out that at small screeners on pretty much any podcatcher you've got. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. Hey, for myself, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Source Material Comics podcast, bringing you the the comic book content here on the Source Material Comics feed. We also do a show called Unspoken Issues. Chris Armstrong is part of that with me. We hang out. We talk 90s comics. Got a bunch of those in the archive. Go and find them. Uh, Also hanging out with Derry and Dean. And probably next week, you should be seeing our unspoken epics discussion of the 18 issues of unity 18 chapters of unity 30th anniversary of that event by the way that happened in 92 so i guess with that being said you know shout out to the w2m network they'll they'll be in the plugs after this i'm sure but shout out to the w2m network for hosting the podcast we'll be we'll be back at you here pretty soon so for chris armstrong i'm jesse starcher thank you very much for joining us we'll talk to you soon bye-bye Thanks for joining us. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon. 